Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors, NEHGS, and the creator and producer of this series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of American history in the 19th century Gilded Age in New York City, the homes and offices of Jay Gould, Cornelius Vanderbilt and their coterie downtown and uptown in Boston, Kansas, Utah, and on the tracks of the Erie Railroad. On your screen is the schedule for our hour-long event centered on the book, American Rascal, How Jay Gould Built Wall Street's Biggest Fortune by Greg Steinmetz. Soon, Mr. Steinmetz will take over to give us background on his book and share on his screen some great historical images. After that, he'll be joined by moderator Esther Crane for a general discussion before they address some of your questions. Thank you for sharing those as you registered. If you have other queries, do enter them into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to some of those as well. Tonight's talk has been sponsored by Welch and Forbes Private Wealth Management here in Boston. The evening is being recorded by my colleagues in American Ancestors Brew Learning Center. Their video will be published on our website in the day ahead. All registered attendees will be emailed the link. Of course, the real education comes from reading tonight's featured work, American Rascal. Copies can be purchased from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Mass, and sent anywhere in the United States to yourself or as a gift. Use the code AMINS24 and the copies will come signed by the author. American Rascal is great reading for anyone interested in the history of New York, the Gilded Age, the stock market in its infancy, those Wild West years. You'll also gain insight into the burgeoning business of railroads, which in many ways mirrored the steel and manufacturing industries of that time. Greg Steinmetz brings it all to life. Before we start, some background on tonight's speakers. Greg Steinmetz is a partner in a money management firm in New York. He previously worked for the Wall Street Journal where he covered investment banking before becoming Berlin bureau chief and then London bureau chief. His first book was The Richest Man Who Ever Lived, The Life and Times of Jacob Fugger. It was heralded as one of the best reads of 2015 by Andrew Ross Sorkin, the financial columnist and the Squawk Box anchor. Now about our moderator tonight, Esther Crane is the author of The Gilded Age in New York, 1870 to 1910 and New York City in 3D in the Gilded Age. In 2008, she launched Ephemeral New York, a website that chronicles the city's past. She speaks regularly on topics related to New York City history, especially during the Gilded Age. She also conducts walking tours that explore New York's hidden pockets and little known stories. I've been reading about these tours and I really wanna go on one, especially of the Upper West Side, Riverside Drive. Sounds remarkable. Um, we'll meet Ms. Crane in 20, minutes or so. But for now, um, welcome to you, Greg Steinmetz. It's really wonderful that you've taken time to be with us tonight and to describe this book. Um, I've long been curious about Jay Gould for personal reasons and also professional reasons as I worked in finance. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more. So over to you and welcome. Well, thank, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. I like that nice introduction. Uh, I'm going to share the screen now and show you some slides. I think that'll be make it a little more fun um, for what we're trying to do here. Let's see. Sorry, I've got to bear with me and I'm going to go to slide. Okay, there we go. Uh, my kids like this one or asked me to put that in there. Uh, to show that the book is legitimate. So there you go, there's the book. Uh, you notice it's, it's a bunch of financial people. The, the book has a lot of finance in it, but I tried to actually tone that down. Um, here, if, if you don't know much about Jay Gould, and I assume most of you don't, because not a lot of people do, he was, he was important. Uh, 
Railroads built America and Gould built the railroads. He built more track than anyone. At one time, he controlled 15% of the country's rail network at a critical time before the highways, of course. Railroads were everything. Because of Gould and some of his sneaky tactics, we got our first rules governing finance. The first regulatory agency in the country was the Massachusetts Railroad Commission, which was started by Henry, uh, Henry Adams, the grandson of uh, the president and the great grandson of another. They started uh, regulating railroads because of gold. And he was every bit as rich and powerful as Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, and Carnegie, but uh, we don't know much about him. Mark Twain knew about him. He called Gould the mightiest disaster to ever have befallen this country. What he meant by that is instead of Americans being disgusted by Gould and his underhanded tactics, they were inspired. They thought, okay, I'm gonna cut corners. And if I do that successfully, I'm gonna be as rich as Gould. And Twain was naturally bothered by that. I call this slide, Don't Die Young, because you see the others who I compare him with lived at least into their 80s. Rockefeller uh, lasted a good long time till it was 93. Gold was 56, and that's why we don't know about him. We see here Florence Gold Hall. That's all there is in New York uh, that makes mention of gold, in, at least in Manhattan. Uh, Florence was a daughter-in-law Whereas those other guys, we know about them, as we know about Vanderbilt University, we know about Carnegie Hall, we know about Rockefeller Center. All of these were built after, at an age when Gould was already dead. I think if Gould had lived longer, we might be calling New York University, uh, Gould University, New NYU had their hooks into Gould at the time he died. They got money from his daughter, Helen, uh, but they might have gotten even more had gold stuck around. I'm showing you these two pictures because I want you to rem remember uh, the image on the right. We see gold on the left. This is his grandson on the right. And it underlines the point how even though gold was powerful and important, he's really an obscure figure today. As USA Today points out, they did an article back in 2019, listing the richest Americans who ever lived. And who do they show? They got the picture wrong. They got the description right, but they show the, show the grandson, which I thought was really funny. And the grandson was famous in his own right. He won a, a tennis gold medal at the London Olympics. I think that was 1910, uh, something like that. Uh, but they got the picture wrong, which shows even USA Today, they don't know who Jay Gould is. This is where he, he grew up. The house looks nicer than when, when he was there. He had a really tough childhood. He had six older sisters and he had a father who was an alcoholic. The, his mother died when he was four. He remembers nothing about her other than having kissed her cold lips when he was called to say goodbye to her. Uh, father locked him up in the cellar once. Uh, the sisters came home from school and discovered him. Uh, we see here Roxbury, New York. It's about a two-hour drive from Manhattan. It's a very nice part of the Catskills. It's a nice area. It's pretty, but it's, it's hard to farm. It's a bunch of rocks. It's good for dairy farming, and that's about it. Gould's dad was a dairy farmer. Uh, he made cheese, and he shipped it to the markets in Albany and New York. Uh, tough childhood, and I think that's why Gould wanted to become rich, and he just worked like a dog his entire life. Um, he worked so hard that he made himself sick uh, and he was haunted by illness his whole life. He would get up early in the morning and study and then he would go to school and then he would do odd jobs. And at a young age, he taught himself how to be a surveyor, did a bunch of surveying up in Delaware County as a teenager. In the process, he got to know this gentleman, Zadok Pratt was one of the richest people in New York. He had a tannery up near Roxbury in a town that he named after himself called Prattsville. Pratt had a big ego and we see this, this ugly sculpture on the left. It looks like it was made out of paper mache, but he, he had hired a, a sculptor to come and, and sculpt his, his head in the rocks up there. Uh, 
very big ego. Pratt served as a congressman. His claim to fame was starting the American Statistics Bureau. Uh, he also was behind uh, building a, the Washington Monument. And for his effort, he wanted his name on a plaque on the Washington Monument. They, they laughed him out of Congress for that. Here we see Tanning, uh, Gould liked that Pratt made a lot of money in Tanning, wanted to get in at it. He learned through in his surveying about a hemlock forest up in, uh, in the Poconos where he could build himself a tannery if he only had the money to do it. The hemlock tree is, is down here in the corner. Um, it's very good for, for tanning leather because of the acid in the bark. So you boil it up, you toss the hides in, and lo and behold, you scrape off the gunk and you have leather. By, uh, by flattering Pratt, by sucking up to him, by uh, saying that Pratt was the greatest person who ever lived, he convinced Pratt to give him a bunch of money to start this tannery. And it did okay, but Gould uh, ran into some trouble when there was a, a recession he sold part interest to some guys and ended up having to uh, reclaim the tannery on the advice of council by creating a, a small army of his workers. And they stormed the building and they got the tannery back. Uh, it was called the Battle of Goldsboro. And that underlines the idea that as much as uh, New York is supposed to be this sophisticated, refined place. It was as much the Wild West as the Wild West was with vigilante justice and an absence of law and where you took the law into your own hands. Gould's first big score was inserting himself in the middle of a battle between Vanderbilt, Cornelius Vanderbilt there on the right, and a guy named Daniel Drew on the left. Drew was in charge of the Erie Railroad. Vanderbilt wanted to buy the Erie Railroad so that he would have a monopoly in New York State by merging it with its New York Central. That way he could control all the grain and all the livestock traffic that came in through the Great Lakes, uh, landed in Buffalo, and then put it on rail cars, bring it down to the city. Uh, we mentioned before Vanderbilt, we know him because of Vanderbilt University. Those of us in New Jersey know Drew because of Drew University. Gould put himself in the middle of this fight. He ends up getting the Erie Railroad by printing up a bunch of phony stock certificates. Uh, Vanderbilt doesn't like it. He sues, he gets an arrest warrant for Gould. Gould flees for New Jersey where the law can't touch him. There are no extradition treaties in those days between the states. And uh, you know, another example of how uh, uh, might makes right back in the Gilded Age. Gould was the great brains of the operation. He had help from this guy, a guy named Jim Fisk. See him here in a uniform. He liked to dress in uniforms. He uh, backed a civilian militia just so he could call himself general and mark, march at the head of it in parades. Uh, Fisk was the one who printed the phony stock certificates and defended uh, Gould when they fled to New Jersey. They were in a hotel on the Hudson River on the other side from Manhattan. Uh, he got... Uh, a private army together. He put cannons on the roof. There was a time when Vanderbilt tried to kidnap them, bring them back to New York, and, and Fisk and his friends fought them back. Gould's most famous for this, the Gold Corner, which happened right after he got Erie. With all the money in the Erie treasury, Gould gets the bright idea to buy up all the gold in New York City. If he controlled all the gold, he could make the price go up, uh, sell it to some suckers at the top and make a fortune. To make that happen, he needed the complicity of the U.S. government because the government sat on a lot of gold. If they released it into the market, they could drive the price down. He tried to bribe General Grant to help him out. Grant sensed what was going on, didn't want to get too close to Gould, although he spent quite a bit of time talking to him. Gould did successfully get Grant's son-in-law involved, um, or sorry, brother-in-law, the brother-in-law convinces Grant not to help Gould, but to enforce some policies that played into Gould's hands and made the stock price or the gold price go up. Um, Gould ends up selling by, uh, with the help of Fisk, entering a bunch of uh, phony trades. Fisk should have gone to jail for doing that, but Boss Tweed, who ran New York at the time and appointed all the judges, 
arrange for Fisk to go before a bunch of friendly judges and nothing ever happened. Gould was in cahoots with Tweed. He split the profits of some of his enterprises with Tweed. Uh, here, I was talking about the Wild West earlier. Here's Jesse James, you know, his contemporary with, with Gould. Uh, and in the absence of, of real justice, there is vigilante justice. Fisk gets his comeuppance. Fisk is in love with, with this woman here, Josie Mansfield. Um, and the guy on the right, a guy named Stokes, was her real boyfriend. And he tries to blackmail Fisk. Fisk doesn't like that. He goes to the court, gets a conviction charge against Stokes. Stokes spies a gun, tracks Fisk down in the, in the middle of the day to a New York hotel, shoots him in the stomach, kills him. Gould's at the funeral showing uh, emotion, which, people, did, which he didn't, people didn't think he had, just cried his eyes out, bawling besides the coffin. Fisk, uh, Gould has to get some new friends, some partners in crime, as it were, after Fisk leaves the scene. We have Sidney Dillon, who was one of the founders of the Union Pacific Railroad. The Union Pacific Railroad was famous for the credit mobilier scandal. Dillon was, was involved in the middle of that. If you've ever been to Sydney, Nebraska, the home of Cabela's, it's named after Mr. Dillon. Uh, and the other guy, uh, was a options trader and salesman in New York who made a fortune, Russell Sage. And these two were investors in all of Gould's schemes uh, moving forward here. Thomas Edison was involved in a scheme. Gould tried to take over the Western Union Telegraph Company because it was a monopoly and it fit in very well with railroads because he ran telegraph lines alongside the railroads. Uh, Edison came up with some technology that he could use to disrupt Western Union. Gould backed that technology. It didn't work right away. So Gould came up with another way to, uh, to get Western Union. He went, it was owned by the Vanderbilts. He wanted to drive the stock price down. He uh, cancels all his contracts of his own railroads with Western Union, gets some other railroads to buy into a separate telegraph company that he buys. That scares the daylights out of the board of directors of the Western Union. They sue for peace. Uh, the stock price goes down because their profits are disappearing because of the competition. Gold goes in and buys enough of the stock to snatch it away from not Cornelius Vanderbilt, but his son, William, which, who was not as sharp as his father. And Cornelius Vanderbilt called his son a blockhead because he was not up to speed, but by then Cornelius had parted the scene and Gould ends up with Western Union. Here's Union Pacific. Gould ran Union Pacific for a while, he controlled it, and then he comes up with a way to compete with it and get the Union Pacific people, including his friend Sidney Dillon, to sell it to him for a very cheap price. And Dillon is incensed that his friend would do that but Gould says, well, if you didn't sell to me, I would have destroyed the Union Pacific and the Union Pacific board, including Dillon, all agreed with that because Gould was so sharp. They knew they didn't have a chance against him. The, the last financial deal I'm going to show you is the Manhattan Elevated precursor to the subway. It ran tracks along uh, 9th Avenue and I think 3rd Avenue. It was a publicly listed company. It was selling for about 50 bucks a share. Gould owned a newspaper, The New York World. He used it to write nasty stories about how, how the Manhattan Elevator was going to go out of business. It was going to go bankrupt. It was run by crooks. It drives the stock price down to 15. He buys up all he can. And as soon as he gets control of it, lo and behold, The New York World starts writing nice things about the railroad. Stock goes back to 50 bucks a share. And once, once again, Gould ends up with, with more money in his pocket than he did before. If you've seen the show Gilded Age, you'd recognize this guy, the lead character. I think more than anyone, it's based on Gould, kind of looks like him. He's the one with the, the Fifth Avenue house, uh, like Gould. He is a ruthless businessman, but is a loving father. The same is true of Gould. Gould had six children. He uh, loved his wife, he loved his kids. Uh, he doted on them. 
but he was utterly ruthless in business, just like Mr. Russell here. Now in the show, they mention gold, but it's fiction. They can do whatever they want, but I don't think we would have this character if not for G. Gold. Gold uh, had his, uh, he worked all the time, but he also did some things for fun. Um, if you remember, you know, Larry Ellison wanted to win the, the America's Cup and he hired the best boat designers and the best crew and everything else and walked away with the prize. Gould did the same in uh, what was then the, the most important regatta on Long Island Sound. He built a 200 foot uh, steamship with sails there called the Atlanta. When he found out that Vanderbilt's boat was bigger, he made his a little bit bigger. He won the famous Larchmont to Trumbull, Connecticut race. Here is his private rail car, the um, private jet of the day. Here's where he lived on Fifth Avenue. Uh, it's, it's not the prettiest of those old, what do you call it, Beaux Arts house. It, it's not there anymore. It got torn down. It's now uh, on the edge of the Diamond District in the city, perhaps fittingly. Uh, we have Lindhurst, which was his castle uh, up in Terrytown on the Hudson River. In the summer, he would commute from there. He'd take a boat down, uh, pick up some friends like Cyrus Field, the guy who laid the transatlantic cable, and they would ride down to Wall Street together on that big boat that I showed you. He had the biggest greenhouse in the country. This is where he's buried. That's the mausoleum in um, uh, Woodlawn Cemetery. The biggest mausoleum they have there, there's nine Goulds buried inside there. There is no name out there. Gould didn't want any, anyone to know that he was there. Uh, there were grave robbers when he was buried. That might explain why. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk a lot about his children, but the oldest one liked, was as good at spending the money as his father was in making it. This is Georgian Court out in uh, near Lakewood, New Jersey. At one time, it was the biggest uh, residence in the US and I uh, had a golf course on the property. It's now a uh, college after Gould, uh, George Gould squandered the money and he had to get rid of it. So, so that's my speech. So now we're ready for questions. Well, thanks so much, Greg. Um, that was really uh, a great overview of what I found to be an incredibly readable um, book. And I'm not somebody who is naturally like well-versed in finance, but I thought it was a wonderful look at a man and some of this treachery that we cannot even imagine. And as you say, he was also a loving husband and father. Um, and that dichotomy is so interesting to me. Um, we can start with an audience question. Um, so given the lack of financial oversight and regulation in the 1860s, uh, is there anything that um, President Grant or his treasury secretary, George Boutwell, could have done differently to prevent Black Friday in September of 1869 or prevent the manipulation of the gold market uh, by Gould and Fisk. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly what Gould wanted them not to do. What they could have done, Gould owned all the gold that was in private hands, or at least had contracts to buy it all. Uh, Grant could have just gone on with the policy that he already had in place, which was keeping the gold price low. Gould convinced him and his Grant's uh, brother-in-law convinced him to keep the gold price high, arguing that it would be good for farmers. But at any moment, the government could have just released government gold into the market and destroyed the corner. And that's ultimately what they did, but it didn't happen until after Gould made a pile of money and the price got very high. So Gould, he's known in you know popular culture now um, by those who know him at least, um, is sort of like the personification of the robber baron. Um, and then there's other people, of course, there's Carnegie, Rockefeller, they've also earned that title. But were there any examples of these titans of industry, these, these guys, these financiers who were actually upstanding citizens and maybe played by the rules? Well, one thing about Gould is most of his victims were other people who were trying to do to him exactly what he was doing to them. There were other Wall Street types. But in the case of the Manhattan Elevated deal, there were widow widows and orphans who got hurt. Um, let's see, Carnegie gave away all his money. And he, he made it 
using all the tricks that Gould did, or a lot of them, but he gave it all away. So, you know, was was he upstanding? History certainly remembers him as being a good guy for building the Carnegie Libraries, Carnegie Hall. The Carnegie Foundation still gives away oodles of money every year. Uh, Vanderbilt was probably the best example of someone who played by the rules, which is interesting because he was one of the people who would say, you know, I don't have to play by the rules because I'm so rich, but he tried very hard to run a good uh, service for his customers. Uh, Vanderbilt did not only rails, but he also had steamships and, and other things in the New York area. And he provided customers with very good service. Uh, did he always play by the rules? No. But again, he gave away a ton of money and he's probably saved a lot of lives by all the money that he pumped into Rockefeller University and all the medical research. Uh, and then the last one, um, let's see, so we got Carnegie, yeah, Carnegie, Vanderbilt. And now I, I suppose some of the people like George Westinghouse who were just pure inventors, um, they didn't have to, they didn't have to cut corners. They could just sell good products. Uh, but by and large, uh, who was it, Baudelaire, who said that all fortunes are built on a crime, and I, th I think that generally applies. And I guess, um, as you say in the slideshow, Gould might have been remembered, he might have had a better reputation if he lived long enough to give all of his money away and put his name on things that well, benefited um, society. Yeah, he didn't have a chance to rehabilitate himself. <laughs> so we don't remember now all the nasty things that Rockefeller did to his competitors. But we, we remember Rockefeller Center every time right. Christmas rolls around and we see the tree. Right? And Carnegie as well. Yeah. Um, this is another reader question. Um, was Gould the source for any character? Um, did he inspire any character in Edith Wharton's work or Henry James or any of the other authors of the time? That's an interesting question. And I looked into that. And the, the, the literary reference that I found that was most relevant wasn't about Gould, but about August Belmont. You know, we've got Belmont race track where they hold one of the triple crowned races. Anthony Trollope uh, wrote a book called The Way We Live Now. And the lead character in there is, has a lot in common with Belmont, including the name. But no, I haven't found Gould in literature. That means he's not there. It's just that I haven't come across it. Yeah. You think that there might be, but no. Well, maybe the the Gilded Age TV show is his, uh, you know, yeah. the closest inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you mentioned that Gould, uh, he didn't work all the time, although work was his his passion. Uh, he he had a yacht that he loved as well. Um. But what other leisure activities did he pursue, if any, or was there any passion besides uh, business and his fortune? And we have this slide. Um. This is probably, yeah, the 1860s in Central Park. And here are some of the, you know, wealthy people of, of uh, Fifth Avenue and Murray Hill at the time, uh, you know, driving their carriages and, uh, you know, in the middle, in the afternoon, which was a very common thing around four or five o'clock uh, in Central Park. I can imagine that uh, Gould would not be found among them, though. No, you know, Gould had a whole garage full of these things. Um, and you know all the interesting names, uh, Phaetons and Broms and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much he got out on these, uh, but he did uh, have them for, uh, in addition to the boating, his, his primary uh, leisure activity, apart from the boating, was I mentioned his mom who died very young. He didn't know his mom at all, but he did know that she liked flowers. And she planted flowers all around their house up in Roxbury. Those survived her, of course, uh, the roses and whatnot. So Gould took an interest in flowers and he had a garden atop his Fifth Avenue mansion. And then he had this, this greenhouse. Uh, when he bought Lindhurst, that house on the Hudson, it came with the greenhouse. That was one of the reasons he bought it. Uh, it burned down shortly after he bought the house and then he rebuilt it. And on days that he was, was at Lindhurst, 
he would, after dinner, you know, go and calm himself down for from a day, a hard day at work by just you know, strolling the greenhouse and uh, and absorbing the ozone and, and really unwinding just by walking through the greenhouse. And he was also involved with, uh, I think, creating some new species of orchids and, and that sort of thing. So he took okay. it pretty seriously. So there's no Gould orchid named after him, though? <laughs> no, I, I came across a Gould orchid, but I couldn't trace it back to him. Oh, maybe. Uh, I think in the book, though, you mentioned that, you know, he enjoyed just kind of coming home and, to his home and, and reading. Yep. And I'm somebody that's always curious about what people read. Is there any information on what he would be reading? Well, his favorites I'm... were were everyone else's favorites. He liked Mark Twain, even though Mark Twain didn't like him. He liked mm -hmm. Dickens. Um, he His library had a lot of classics. Did he read those? Uh, maybe, but he, he didn't he didn't cite them. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly what he read uh, other than the, the, the popular books of the day. He also had a book on the shelf about um, phrenology, you know, reading bumps mm. on heads. That was very popular at the time. Maybe that belonged to his wife. Um, he he read a lot for work. He absorbed you know, newspapers and newsletters. He would go, after having dinner with his family, he would go to the hotels near his house just to gossip with brokers, to hear any rumors that could help him in his trading the next day. Uh, so yeah, he, he kept busy. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of his house, I'm curious about that mansion. Did he have that built for himself? The Fifth Avenue? Yeah. No, it, the I think the first op occupant was a guy named Updike, who was a mayor of New York. Okay. And back when when that part of Fifth Avenue was, was just developing, the slide I showed you had two gas lights in front of it. And that was something that was given to anyone who was mayor. Uh, gas lights were unusual when the house was built, but if you're a mayor, they would, they would take special pains to run the gas line up to your house and install some lights. Uh, Gould really liked that because he wasn't the best sleeper and he would just wander around the, the neighborhood at night and he liked that he had lights to come home to. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine there were enough bedrooms uh, for all of the kids and yeah. parlors and sitting rooms and, and everything. Servants and the whole bit. Yeah. yeah. There's such a fascination with the, you know, the Gilded Age houses of the era. Um, uh, did it bother him, though, that his house was, you know, nothing like, say, like um, the Vanderbilt mansion on Fifth Avenue and 57th Street, which I think we have a slide of as well. Um, yeah. Well, that, that, that mansion was built by one of the sons, uh, built after Gold's house. Did it bother him? No, I don't think he com he competed that way. He competed the way he kept score was money mm -hmm. and and power. So if people feared him. And uh, knew that he was rich. I think that was good enough for him. Now his his son George, we showed that picture before. Uh, he did like to show off, but Gould was not really one to flaunt it. One of the last recorded acts that we know of him, uh, Gould went to the Westchester County Fair and rode there himself in a, in a horse drawn buckboard that he controlled. <laughs> uh, he was still uh, a country boy. That's great. Um, so Gould owned a newspaper, the New York World. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that newspaper? Was that one of the tabloids of the era or was it, you know, more serious like the Herald? Uh, it was a it was an organ for the Democratic Party. And Gould, as we talked about his relationship with Boss Tweed, was a Democrat. Uh, it he ended up selling it to Joseph Pulitzer. Pulitzer oh. turns it into, you know, the premier paper in New York City, um, and you know, it changed its its um, editorial policy and everything else. Uh, so, no, I, I think it was a broadsheet. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, you know, the era of the great newspapers and you know, newspaper row. Yeah. I'm assuming that uh, the rest of the press uh, treated him with disdain and disgust? Yes. Was there any newspaper that came to his aid? No. 
Uh, the New York Times likened him to Mephistopheles in an editorial. Uh, the other papers gave him a lot of grief too um, because of the, the corruption he was engaged in in New York City. He, mm -hmm. And the fact that he never uh, saw justice for that. You know, he was arrested three times, but never convicted. Um, when Boss Tweed was arrested, Gould was there to provide the bail money. And as long as Tweed was around, Gould was protected. After Tweed left and went to jail, uh, Gould protected himself by hiring the best lawyers in town. And he kept um, many lawyers in New York uh, busy all the time. I think there were 200 suits against him being defended just by a single law firm. Mm -hmm. Did Gould ever invest in uh, European railroads? This is a reader question. Yeah, uh, not that I know of. Mo the money flowed from Europe to the States. There wasn't a lot of growth in Europe. The US was an emerging market and Europeans invested uh, in the States. I mentioned that Trollope book, The Way We Live Now. Uh, one of the, the drivers of the plot is a, a fraudulent scheme called the, the uh, Mexican Railway where they lured money from, from unwitting investors, aristocrats and whatnot in the UK and Germany, and they invested in this sham railroad. Gould didn't do anything like that. His railroads were, were names we know, you know, the Union Pacific, Kansas Pacific, Missouri, these sort of things. Uh, here's another reader question. Um, many of the railroad barons were in cahoots with J.D. Rockefeller, uh, providing Rockefeller with discounted transportation for his oil versus the other oil producers. Uh, did Gould do the same? That, that was a, a Carnegie thing. Um, there there might have been some deals. I, it, it wasn't central to what he was doing. Um, he mostly shipped grain and, and cattle. Uh, he he didn't have uh, the railroad that did a lot of that was the, the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, he didn't have anything to do with that one. Uh, that was those were others. Okay. Uh, another reader asks about uh, his involvement in Western Union, um, mm -hmm. why he uh, invested in Western Union, why he wanted this. Do you have any, want to shed any light on why that interested him? Well, the best business is a monopoly and Western Union had a monopoly because as a network, you're, you uh, are only as good as your coverage area. So the more coverage you have, the better. And if you're, want to get a telegram from California to New York, you probably have to uh, hop on a bunch of different lines to make that happen. So you want a seamless network to make it efficient. Western Union had that. So Gould wanted to get that, not only because it was really profitable and spit out enormous dividends, but it worked perfectly with railroads because you ran the telegraph poles parallel on the right of ways of the railroads and you set up telegraph stations inside the railroad stations and, uh, and just perfect synergy between those two businesses. Mm -hmm. so Gould was, was tickled pink when he managed to get his hands on the Western Union. My understanding um, through your book is that Gould just actually really loved railroads. Yeah, yeah, that was, you know, the internet of the day. It was something new and different and changing the world. Uh, there's also a lot of money in it. And it was the first industry that required just enormous amounts of capital. Uh, Wall Street sort of came into being because of the railroads. It was the only place where you could raise enough money to do, to buy the tracks, buy the, uh, the land, uh, everything else you needed to run a railroad. So there was just so much money slashing around that industry. Gould wanted to be close to it. But the technology also appealed to him too. I know through my own research into the Gilded Age that um, after the Civil War, there was what one writer called stock mania. And like a lot of sort of regular people were, were enticed yeah. by what they called stock gambling and the Wall Street and the stock market. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Just how this was like this whole new thing for the average New Yorker to get involved in and possibly lose, you know, a lot of money in? Or make a lot of money. Or um, make a lot of money. Well, in order to finance the Civil War, the union had to raise a lot of money and they did it by selling bonds 
to uh, the general public. And the bonds paid off and they paid nice coupons out to their investors. So that got the public introduced to investing for the first time. And they wanted to uh, continue to do that after the war. And that opened up um, this opportunity on Wall Street to, to sell stock to the general public and they found a receptive market. Uh, Russell Sage, he was the one who pioneered the sale of options to retail investors. And with options, you can, uh, you can make more and lose more, just very high risk bets using options and, and the public. Same people who went to the track really like buying Russell Sage's options. So mm -hmm. that whole market developed during this time. Track was big too at this time. Was huge, yeah. uh, this is a reader question asking you about the process of writing the book. Um, how long did it take you to write it? And uh, how did you go about doing that? Well, um, because I had a day job, it took a long, long time. And uh, it was seven years between the two books. And I had started working on this one, or at least, you know, doing the preliminary research as soon as I finished uh, my first book. Um, and the, the process was, you know, first I read everything that I could that was out there on gold, um, ended up dipping into the archives, which was difficult during COVID. But one of the pivotal documents to write the book was the congressional investigation into the gold scandal. That's, that was all online. Uh, was able to visit a few archives and then I wrote the book mostly on the train on Metro North going into work, mm -hmm. um, and sneak time on weekends to do it. Uh, so it was just a very long process. It shouldn't have taken that long. Um, kind of fitting that you wrote it on a train. Yeah, that's right. And not only that, but I would pass some of the landmarks, uh, Woodlawn Cemetery, you know, drive right. by there on the train, drive by Lindhurst, you know, coming down from Westchester, uh, driving into, uh, Grand Central Station, which was built by Vanderbilt. So mm -hmm. there are little traces of gold just on my commute. Uh, the story was very close to home for me. Uh, I mentioned the boat race, Larchmont to Trumbull, Larchmont, Westchester County, that's where I live. Uh, gold founded the American Yacht Club, which was up, up the road from me in Rye. So it's a very New York story. It's a very uh, Westchester County story, which made it more fun. You can kind of feel the ghosts of all these characters as you pass by. Oh, yeah. yeah can be inspiring nice. or unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about uh, Gould's wife. I know her name was Helen, but she went by Ellie. Yep. Uh, was she the daughter of somebody wealthy? Was she, um, did she feel, was she as happy with her home life as her husband was? She grew up in, uh, Right where where Edith Wharton grew up, that same same neighborhood around Gramercy Park, Murray Hill, down there. Uh, her dad was a, a prominent um, grocery wholesaler. He was he was pretty rich. Um, the The story was that Gould was living in in a boarding house uh, around Twenty Third Street. He caught her eye walking down the sidewalk one day. Uh, got to know the father, or the father knew about Gould already because Gould was making a name for himself on Wall Street, recognized that he was a very smart guy on the way up. Uh, probably didn't like the fact that he came from uh, poor uh, you know, farming stock, but they got married. She was very uh, shy and introverted, uh, church going, uh, she's a good mother. She wasn't a social climber, except for the fact that she wanted her daughters to marry well. Mm -hmm. And so she tried her best to uh, introduce her daughters into New York society. They, uh, along with the Vanderbilts, they had to start their own opera company because the New York Opera didn't want Nouveau Riche in there. Uh, she was involved in that. She was very good friends with Russell Sage's wife who helped bring her out of her shell. She died even younger than Gold of, of TB. Um, and you know, he was devastated by that. Um, and then you know, he uh, died from the, from the same disease a few years later. 
You say that she wasn't a social climber. Um, what struck me about the couple is that, um, you know, for all of Gould's, you know, uh, being prominent in the business world on Wall Street and all the newspapers, you would think that he would be somebody who would be attending all of the Gilded Age, you know, all the events that the era is known for, the balls and the, you know, dinners at Delmonico's and the horse show and the nights at the opera and the theater. Uh, but it seems like um, from your book, he's very much a homebody and his wife was as well. Is yeah. that that's how they were? Or is it just that maybe nobody invited them to anything because Gould was so reviled? Well, the Astries never invited him anywhere, but, but they did go to shows. Uh, he went to the Mount Delmonico's a lot. That was the company cafeteria. After he did the Erie heist, before they snuck off to New Jersey, Fisk took him to Delmonico's and they ate a bunch of oysters and, and had to flee the scene when police burst <laughs> through the door to try to capture them. So Delmonico's was something they went to a lot. Uh, Fisk owned a opera house on 23rd Street. Uh, Goldwood, he attended the theater one night with General Grant sitting in his box and bent his ear off about what he should do with gold. Mm -hmm. um, so they did get out, but that wasn't, that wasn't that important to them. They didn't own a place in Newport. Uh, which a lot of people in those days did. Oh, they did or didn't? Did not. Okay. Did not. Well, they had Lindhurst. They had Lindhurst. Yep. Yep. But the 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 scene, the scene in Westchester wasn't the same as it was in Newport. Uh, and he commuted from there, so during the summer he would he would go to work and, and not take the summers off to to frolic in the sun like the Newport crowd. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a reader question. Uh, you mentioned that he came from modest means, similar to Carnegie. Um, any thoughts on the psychological motivations for wanting to be so wealthy? Yeah, I, th I think he wanted to save his own children from the hardships he experienced as a, as a kid. Uh, you know, his father was drunk. He was poor. Um, he, Gould's father couldn't even afford a farmhand, so he did everything himself. Um, and as soon as Gould was able, he would, would help him, although Gould didn't want to spend his life on the farm. So he got out of there as soon as he can. Um, so I, I think that's where the, the impetus came. But uh, Gould was, he, he was obsessive. Um, as a, as a you know, kid in school, if the teacher called him up to the blackboard to do a math problem, Gould would stand there until he finished it, figured it out. Um, even you know school would be done and he'd still be standing there until he could crack the code. So yeah, I think he wanted to make a lot of money for the sake of his family, but but where that that special something comes from, you know, who the heck knows. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was also, I think part of it wanted he wanted to maybe restore the family to its former luster. He grew up poor, but he had ancestors who uh, came over, uh, very early, uh, maybe not on the Mayflower, but before George Washington's family ever did. And they fought uh, as officers in the Continental Army. Uh, they were pretty prominent back in uh, Massachusetts, uh, but the, the wealth got dissipated and, and Gould grew up dirt poor, but he knew about his, his family. And uh, I think he did want to restore the name. Mm -hmm. This is another reader question. Uh, Gould was born early enough to have served in the American Civil War. Uh, did he hire a substitute or serve in his stead, or did he uh, volunteer? Yeah. No, that's a that's a good question, and and I looked into that one. Uh, it would have cost three hundred dollars, which was a lot. Uh, that was maybe you know, six seven thousand dollars in those days to buy your way out. But Gould got out because he had to be five three, and he was not five three. He might have been only. Uh, five feet tall. So he got out because he was too short. He never had to buy a substitute like a lot of people did. Although I'm sure he would have, no question. I think in your, your book, you described him as Elfin. Is that yeah, right? that was one of the words they threw around. Uh, think of you know any, any colorful word to describe someone <laughs> who's five feet tall and, and people would hurl that at him. Gould was active in a in the Gilded Age, which is you know a time where there were lots of social and political changes going on in the country, and I'm just curious if if he ever this if we know how he felt about things like uh, suffrage or women's rights or the temperance movement or even the abolitionist movement. 
Well, uh, Temperance, for one, is a big supporter. He was a teetotaler. He uh, spoke every chance he could about the curse of drink. He ascribed his victory in taking his tannery back to the fact that his thugs were sober and the other side was, those people were paid with whiskey. So he was, uh, yeah, definitely in the temperance camp. Uh, civil rights, uh, I can't find anything. Uh, I do know he would hire whoever would, would work for less. He, he had some Swedish people working for him, building railroad track out west. He, he fired them and hired Chinese. Um, suffrage, never said anything about that. He did write, a, I, I found a reference to him having written an article in defense of J.W. Seligman, who is one of his brokers. Seligman was Jewish. He was getting some, some grief and Gould wrote a, a editorial in defense of Seligman. Um, so he, he didn't have any religious bias as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Um, so Gould had six children, and I'm wondering if you can uh, shed a little light on what happened to them and if any of his descendants are around today. Yeah. I know you mentioned his son, George. Yep, yep. Uh, it, it's interesting. Vanderbilt wanted to keep the wealth concentrated, so he gave it all to his blockhead son, William, and his other children. I don't know how many there were. There might have been 10 other. They sued to try to get a little bit more. But William ended up with, with all of it. It was sort of you know, primogeniture where the oldest son gets everything. Gold wanted to do it the exact opposite way. He split everything right down the board. Uh, everyone got a one six share. And what they and they did different things with it. Uh, George thought that he could take the fortune to the next level and do what Gold wanted to do his entire life, which was to create a seamless railroad network across the country. But he was no match for the people who were uh, even better at doing these sort of things than he was. Um, Harriman was one. I, I think someone mentioned uh, James Hill. These people were just much better uh, than, than George Gold was at playing the game. Um, they were at, at Jay's level. Uh, so he was, uh, he ends up falling on, on hard times. Uh, the daughter, Helen, she was very good with her money. Uh, she was Gould's favorite. He didn't bring her to board meetings like he did George and his other sons to teach them about business, but he spoke to her a lot about business and she was very savvy with her money. Um, she gave it away. She was in charge of Gould's uh, whatever philanthropic things he was doing. Um, and she was very involved with the church did a lot of good, um, ended up marrying when she was 45 or so. And uh, her name probably has, has stood up the best uh, historically. One of the other sons, Edwin, he was a pretty good businessman himself. Uh, at least one of the daughters married a fallen European aristocrat who wanted to bring some, some money back into the family. There's a lot of that stuff going on. One of them married someone in France who ended up squandering all the money on real estate. So it was, it was a mixed bag, but there are still a lot of Goulds out there. There's, there's a, a pocket in upstate New York. There's a pocket down in Baltimore and uh, in the DC area. Um, and they still uh, have a place up in, in Westchester where some of the family members go to, uh, not in Westchester, up in up near Roxbury. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of ghouls, uh, but they're not, it's not like Rockefeller or Kennedy where you, where you keep hearing their names. They're, they're, they're not public figures. Um, and maybe one last question. This is a reader question um, asking about the circumstances of his death. Mm -hmm. Well, he suffered from uh, tuberculosis all his life and was, was very sickly. He, he worked so hard when he was a teenager, he destroyed his health. He would be riding around in the dead of winter looking for hemlock groves and surveying and this sort of thing. He 
he worked himself nearly to death and he never really got over it. Uh, he you know, was suffering from coughing fits his entire life. So he died when he was 46 of, of TB and he thought that he wanted to keep his illness secret as long as he could because he thought the Wall Street sharks would come out and, and attack his investments if he wasn't around. So his, his death came sort of as a surprise. Um, and when he died, you know, the press swarmed the house and people were sneaking into his funeral, um, trying to steal mementos and all the rest of it. It was kind of sad what happened. Um, but yeah, he died young. That was it. And he's at Woodlawn. And he is at Woodlawn Cemetery, which is a great place to visit. All sorts of famous people are buried there. Thank you both for sharing such amazing stories. This has been a really fascinating tour of New York. I mean, from Delmonico's to the elevated train, from Roxbury to Lyndhurst to Woodlawn, where we are hearing from a number of folks on this um, Zoom that have relatives buried there. So it's it's all coming full circle here. And it's fascinating. Um, really grateful. As we do for all of our authors in the American Inspiration Series, we've asked um, Greg to do a final reading from his book. So Greg, back to you yes. for that, for a three minute reading. Okay. This is from, uh, it's near the end of the book where I, I try to do an appraisal of gold. You know, what are we to make of this guy? So here's what I write. Um, in the middle of the Great Depression, the writer Gustav Myers called Gould a pitiless human carnivore. And Matthew Josephson, who brought us the term robber baron, uh, trotted Gould into service as an argument against capitalism. For those two socialist writers, Gould was a rapacious, loathsome, and felonious union buster, the embodiment of why America needed a Lenin to overthrow the system. Historians of more recent vintage offer some balance. They argue Gould should be judged in light of his times and against his peers. Insider trading and market manipulation were legal, so Gould can hardly be faulted for that. Bribing the New York legislature was morally reprehensible, but given the corruption of the age, a cost of doing business. In a 1986 biography, University of Rhode Island professor Murray Klein suggested Gould should be judged in his entirety rather than on his business activity alone. Gould's record as an upstanding family man should be figured into the equation. Wharton professor Julius Gradinsky, who in 1957 completed the first serious analysis of Gould, took pains to credit Gould's contributions. Gould's aggressive track building lowered freight rates. His success as a railroad investor attracted speculative capital into a vital industry when other sources fled the field. But after examining every transaction of Gould's career, poring over every scrap of correspondence, considering every accusation of victims, and compiling spreadsheets to measure Gould's investments, Gradinsky couldn't pull the trigger on a definitive judgment about his subject. His conclusion was unsatisfying. He had his virtues and he had his faults, he wrote. Poets might come closer to the truth. In Babbitt, written in 1922, Sinclair Lewis dissected American values and reproached the money-grubbing businessman of a fictional Midwestern town. He could just as easily have been talking about Jay Gould when he describes the quote, clean, kind, industrious family men who use every known brand of trickery and cruelty to ensure the prosperity of their cubs. Gould was all these things. Lewis's judgment hits it on the head. The worst things about these fellows, he wrote about Babbitt, is that they're so good, and in their work at least so intelligent, you can't hate them properly. That's the thing about Gould. He lied, he cheated, he stole, but he was so good at what he did, so intelligent in the execution, and such a clean, kind, and industrious family man that, try as you might, you can't hate him properly. Thank you, Greg, for sharing these many, many insights and the context um, from that Gilded Age era and decades after. I mean, you mentioned Babbitt and Lenin. I mean, he was a family man, clearly. And I guess it takes all types to keep this country's engines in motion. So that's true. 
Yeah. It does. It takes all sorts. So um, really, really fascinating. I do want to remind our audience that signed copies of American Rascal can be purchased from our partners at Porter Square Books in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and sent anywhere in the uh, U.S. to yourself or as a gift. Um, Greg's book, may inspire a recent grad headed into business um, or to urban living, or maybe a dad, a mom, an industrious cousin, a fan of the TV series, needs to read this tale of the Gilded Age. Um, there is something for everyone in this story, and I learned a tremendous amount. Ordering information and the code to get a signed copy is on the screen and in the chat, and it's going to be emailed to you. Um, we moving toward wrapping up for tonight's discussion, we give special thanks to our sponsors, Welch and Forbes Private Wealth Management. We appreciate the support of the team there and they work that they do to help families. We at American Ancestors NEHDS are delighted to have presented tonight's book talk. If you're researching a time, a person, or a family, my colleagues are here to help you. Free to the public, you can chat with one of our genealogists and our Brew Family Learning Center hosts many educators educational programs. You'll see on screen that we provide insight on accessing all sorts of records that make up America's diverse history. Our mission and all we do is to educate, inspire, and connect. Uh, one connection we have made through this author series is to the award Oscar Award winning director Ron Howard. We hosted him in a virtual book talk last April with Ken Burns. This April, we're hosting him again, but in person. On April 25 at the Four Seasons here in Boston, we'll be revealing his family history at a gala dinner. So we hope you'll join us for this celebratory evening. Um, the link is in the chat and will also be sent to you. Um, it's a benefit for my organization, American Ancestors. And for you literary sorts, book lovers, readers, please join us for more author talks, um, free author talks, and, and some nominal, nominally feed ones. Looking ahead, a week from Tuesday on April 2nd, we'll hear from author Rachel Jamison Webster about her new book, Benjamin Banneker and Us, 11 Generations of an American Family, with moderator historian Kendra T. Field of Tufts University. She'll trace back from today through the true story of her passing as white family to her mixed race relative, Benjamin Banneker, a celebrated 18th century mathematician, astronomer, and surveyor of Washington, DC at the time of his friend, Thomas Jefferson. On May 2, we'll look at the life, work, and legacy of Isabella Stort Gardner, the remarkable collector and world traveler who was born in New York in 1840 and made her mark in Boston, especially with the 1903 opening of her museum, which to this day displays her fabulous collection of European masters in a Venetian-style palace in the Fenway neighborhood. So that should be a fascinating talk. And on May 9, we welcome back the popular historian and engaged aging presenter and debater Stephen Puglio with his new work of history, the great abolitionist Charles Sumner and the fight for a more perfect union. Special for this event, after his fully illustrated presentation, um, Stephen Puglio will invite members of the audience on screen to ask questions. So don't miss this interactive event. Back to tonight, I want to thank our guests this evening, author Greg Steinmetz and moderator Esther Crane, who's uniquely knowledgeable about New York. Greg is obviously uniquely knowledgeable about New York and also the finance world, which is the world that he was living in, in that Wall Street era. Uh, Jay Gould, I truly enjoyed tonight's discussion. And to the audience out there in Zoom land, we thank you. We appreciate your interest in America's history, all the places and people, the good and the bad stories of where we've come from, looking at the progress we've made in this country. So we hope to see you soon again. And again, thank you all and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.